afternoon, and first of all, a uh, very blessed new year to all my dear brethren in Christ. Now, this whole week I was pondering what to speak for for the first message of the new year, because by tradition, the first message will be the theme for our whole year. So with this message, I'd like to set the tone right for all our spiritual learning for the rest of the year. Now, I don't know if you remember at the start of last year, I spoke on simplicity where I emphasize the need to live our Christian life with simple faith. And for this year, and I was gathering my thoughts, and first of all, a few things impressed upon my heart. And first, um, at the end of last year, we finished with the youth camp, and we had a very wonderful emphasis with the team, our time is short, that was very much emphasized to the youth. And then with the year-end sharing, although it was a five hours meeting, I was quite moved by what our brethren shared about being standing firm in the midst of their trials. And they make light of their temporal suffering because of the glory they've seen in Christ. And then just yesterday, I think we had a great start with the new reform series. We spoke about secularism. We spoke about the danger of the here and now worldview. And we spoke about how the Bible admonish and rebuke those who make light of what is transcendent and eternal. And as I was uh, gathering all these messages and convictions, I concluded that the most pressing spiritual lesson that God has for us this year for the English service is to learn to live this life in view of our next life. Now, as I was pondering through this, I was brought to the Lord's message to the disciples during the Last Supper. Now, maybe we could have a quick run-through of that message. I'm going to just point you to a few snippets. Now, chapter 14, verse 1, okay? Verse 1 to 4, and Jesus said, this is the Last Supper sermon. He said, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. And verse 15 if you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. Peace I live with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. And right here, our Lord promised the Holy Spirit. He also promised the peace that will come through the Holy Spirit. And then our Lord Jesus ended his whole sermon with these last words before he went into his priestly intercession for the disciples and his chosen people. Verse 33 of chapter 16. Can we read all this together? I have told you these things, so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Now, I don't know if you noticed, the word trouble kept appearing. In fact, it was at the beginning of the message, do not let your hearts be troubled. And then it ended off with, in this world you will have trouble. And trouble, trouble, trouble. And having trouble is common. And I would say it is typical of the Christian life experience. So on that, on that basis, I would say that the whole message here by our Lord Jesus will make no sense to you if you don't feel there is any trouble at all in this life. If you love this life so much, if this life is all what you want, if this life to you is simply an enjoyment, if the pleasure achievement, gratification, 
indulgence of this life is enough to satisfy you, then I, don't, I think this message by our Lord Jesus makes no sense to you. And simply speaking, you don't need this message at all. Because your best life will be this life. And sad to say, your worst life will be the next life. But if you could resonate with what our Lord Jesus said about this life, if you could see the reality of trouble in this life, then you are a truthful person. And the words which our Lord Jesus brought forth will be great consolation to you. Now, you understand that the Bible is not being negative, but understand that the Bible speaks about nothing else but the reality. But there are so many who were fed what I call the here and now gospel. They refuse to accept that reality. And ironically, today, so many people enter Christianity in the hope of escaping trouble. And false teachers will tell their audience that there are no trouble at all. It's an enjoyable life here. You enjoy Jesus, you enjoy this life, we enjoy everything now. But on the contrary, to what Jesus said in his sermon, in this world you will have trouble. But the exhortation is, do not let your hearts be troubled. You saw that? There will be trouble. Externally, there will be trouble. Spiritually, trouble will come because Christians by default have spiritual enemies. But the encouragement is, do not let your hearts be troubled. And the Lord Jesus did not promise a trouble-free life, but the Lord promised a quiet and peaceful heart in the face of all trouble. The Lord promised a heart that could withstand any sorts of trouble in this world. And the basis to which your hearts can withstand any sorts of trouble and to be at real peace, even in the midst of trouble, is what Christ has revealed and promised in these few chapters of his message. And this is where I'm leading you to in my sermon today. Now, before we get to that, now I want to say something very subtle about the world we live in. Now, in consideration to all the troubles we face in this life, I would say the world has offered nothing but futile solutions. It offers no real answers to the human predicament. The most it could offer is to minimize your pain and suffering for a season. It offers you money. It offers you fame. It may offer you a short-term purpose. It offers you relationship, maybe, or sometimes even the warmth of a family. But it offers you no ultimate solution. Why? Because it doesn't have this solution to start with. So 1 John 2, 17 says, The world and all its desires passed away. Everything about this world will pass away. When this generation is over, nothing will be left in this life of ours. And just thinking about this, makes us despair, isn't it? And this life itself is full of trouble and uncertainty. There will never be a constant high in this life and in this world. In reality, the world of sin is also a world of disappointment. It is a world of suffering. So, in our consideration of how to obtain a quiet and peaceful heart in this suffering world, the first thing which the Lord has emphasized to us in his message here is none other than his relationship with us. His relationship with us. Now, the way to face this suffering life, the Bible taught us, is to face it with something greater than this life. And that is God himself. Now, so the very first words God, Jesus gave in his exhortation was this. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in who? Trust in God. Trust in me. You see that? 
God must be in the picture of this troubled life. There are no other solutions. Everywhere you look at this world, even your loved ones, you will only end up with disappointment. And sometimes it's not because your loved one don't love you enough. They could be helpless in the face of your troubled life also. They don't know how to help you. I have ministered to children, depressed children, whose parents are helpless because of their depressed children. They couldn't help them. They love their children so much. But there's nothing they can do. So you see, to have true peace, there must be a consideration in you that there is something bigger than this world, than this life of yours. And that is God. And having Him in your life is not just to acknowledge His presence, but to trust Him. That's why Jesus said, trust in God, trust in me. You see, the word trust, trust connotates a personal relationship. You have to trust the person who could see you through. And so, my brethren, to face this troubled life, you have sometimes learned to turn your back to this life and turn your face to the Lord. Now, indeed, sometimes and many a times, we are so consumed by this life. And when this life disappoints, we got depressed. Now, my brethren, if we truly wish to abide to the Bible, to face this short and suffering life, we can only face it truly in the light of something else, something bigger, something infinite, something unchanging. And that is God and His eternal promise for us. And see the eternal picture. See the eternal reality of your life. You see, the trouble with us is that with our limited perspective, we let life overwhelm us. We let life consume us. But the only way to understand this life, many times, is to step out of it and look at it in the light of eternity. Now, I don't know if you could resonate with me on this point, but consider this. Say, if we're going to tour and we went for tour, we lost in the city. Now, what do you do after that? How do you get out of that predicament? Either we pick up a map, have a view of the whole city, right? Or a better way, or straightforward way would be you go up to the highest building and then have a vast view of the whole city. North, south, east, west, where is the landmark, and so on, and that's it. You will know where you are, you will know where to head to. And you will realize you are not that lost after all. Am I right? So having a whole view of life is tremendously important in helping us face this troubled life. Now, I've counseled many people in my life, and I can tell you, most people are defeated by this life because they only take a piecemeal of it instead of looking at it as a whole. They are so consumed sometimes with their studies that they lost sight of what they are studying for. They are so consumed by the expectation of their bosses, only to realize after that it's only a job. And they are so consumed by what they want for their growing child, you know, and they have sleepless night over it. Now, certainly some of us would think those things matter to us. I mean, yes, of course, to a certain extent, if you are at the juncture of your life, but let me say, no matter how much you feel about it, how much you're concerned of it, it is only a piecemeal of your whole life. There are so many things that God is arranging and orchestrating in this life of ours such that we can live gloriously and eternally with Him. Amen? Man, the problem with this world, brethren, and I would say, to a certain extent, the church, is that nowadays it is offering and shorter and shorter forms of solution. Shorter and shorter forms of solution. For instance, you know, academics, tuition center, offer help. You say, come, bring your children here, learn how to score all A's for PSLE. You know, just for that PSLE alone. <laughs> The teachers you know, in school have to deal with every emotional upheaval that the parents are facing 
because their children are not doing well in school, they are being bullied in school, ostracized by friends. No. And, and the way the world offers solutions for singlehood, you know, and create some website and apps where people can just pick their potential suitors. It's always like, come, you have this problem. Now let me deal with it critically right here and right now. And by that, people's view of this life just gets narrower and narrower. And life becomes just about the here and now. And nowadays, you know, the way many churches conduct healing ministry is getting people to attend some meetings where it tries to bring about a present deliverance. Or they get very personal during some meetings where it tries to ask about our past hurts, our wounds when we were young, what we went through, and try to dig out the little things, you know, the little negative experience people have in their early lives, and try to deliver them. Now I can say sometimes to these people, it feels so real because these counselors or ministers are focusing on the person's present feelings. But it doesn't really set the person free from this troubled life. It doesn't set people free from a potential depressed view of this life. Why? Because it is only dealing with a piecemeal of this life. Those solutions will only increasingly cause men to view life with a tunnel vision. Now, but what do your Lord say? Trust in God. And God is eternal. Trust also in me. And you must take the Lord at his word. Now, why did Jesus say that? Because what is approaching for the disciples is going to be the darkest moment of their lives. Where their Lord will be betrayed, taken away from them, and they will be like sheep, going to be scattered. The whole world around them is going to hate them and come after them. Yet, our Lord Jesus points them to the eternal God, the transcending God. And you must trust Him. You must take Him at His words. Because no other words in this world brings real and lasting solution. Trust in God. Trust also in me. And what does trust mean, my brethren? Trust basically means rest yourself on His faithfulness. And many people misunderstood trust. Oh, trust, I have to believe. I must tell myself to believe. I force myself to believe. No, don't believe even in your ability to believe because your faith will grow weak in this troubled life. But when we say trust in God, it means rest in His faithfulness. Even when you couldn't believe, rest yourself on His faithfulness. So Jesus is essentially saying, it's not your faithfulness. It's God's faithfulness. Now, this is an amazing words of exhortation. And I would say, you will never conquer and master life until you have learned to hold on to God the way in the face of this troubled life. Now, I'm going to take a short moment here to take you to Romans 8. Now, people who have read their Bible knows Romans is one of the best books in the Bible. In Romans 8, is where we reach the climax of Romans. Or some people say the climax of gospel. And here in Romans 8, Paul presented the promise of God through an extremely logical argument. Now let's go to Romans 8. 832. Now, now I'm going to read this with you together. Okay, now, together. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? And go to verse 34. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Now, don't just read these verses plainly. Try to get the robust logic behind these two verses. It is dealing exactly with a couple of root problems with our troubled hearts. Right? Now let's go to verse 32. 
Okay, many people know how to memorize verse 32, okay? But let's try to look at it again, what was Paul trying to say. Now, obviously, Paul knows, as humans, we are concerned of many things. In fact, all things in a human realm. Because it says here, how will he not graciously give us all things, right? All things. So all things in the human realm is natural. They become our concern. We're concerned of studies, we're concerned of work, concerned of marriage, concerned of children, concerned of our parents. When we are old, we are concerned of our health. At different seasons of our life, these things just naturally and involuntarily became our concern, isn't it? And Paul puts all these under the category of all things. And sometimes all things, these things, could cause anxiety in our lives, isn't it? But what does the robust logic of Romans 8.32 tell us? Now listen to this. He who did not spare his own son, it says. Meaning to say, if God could give his own son to you, if God could strip him of all his glory, and make him a subject of sin and shame to purchase your eternity, how will he not graciously give us all things? Amen to that? You, you get the idea? Now, for you to really make sense of this verse, you really have to understand the glory and the beauty of our Lord Jesus. You really have to be absolutely certain about all the vital truths about Jesus. If Jesus means nothing to you, you are not going to buy that logic, isn't it? So then you will never understand the peace and comfort that he is ministering to you right now, which in effect, the Lord Jesus is saying to you, if you do not believe me, or if you are uncertain about what I have done for you, if you do not see any value in what I have done for you, then sorry, I have no comfort to give you. You got it? But if you believe me, if you are certain, if you value of what I've done for you, you will never fail to have my peace and comfort. In this troubled life, your hearts will still be calm and quiet and still. And praise the Lord for that. And I think basically that solves all, almost all our problems of anxiety and depression. Okay? Now let's go to verse 34. Now, again, now let's approach this verse in the same light. Okay? Get the robust logic behind. Okay, it goes like this. Verse 34, now turn to that. Who then is the one who condemns? Now, what is the word here that frightens and unsettles our hearts the most? What word is that? Condemnation. Am I right? Condemnation. Now, so many people are stricken with the feelings of condemnation. Now, we hear words of condemnation from this world around us all the time, don't we? We hear them from our parents, from our teachers, from friends, from colleagues, from bosses, from our brethren, and sometimes from your pastor also, you know. And most of the time, you hear it within yourself. You hear it yourself. Now, our fallen nature subjects us to condemnation all the time. And psychology tells us that one of the most prevalent causes for depression is condemnation. The depressed person lives in pangs of guilt all the time. He feels guilty about the condition he's having now. He feels guilty for being a burden to people now. He feels guilty about how people look at him now. He feels guilty practically about everything. Pangs of guilt. Full of reproach. Full of condemnation. And the world does not understand that the greatest enemy of man whose most fatal weapon is none other than accusations. His name is Satan, the accuser. He accuses and he condemns. And what is frightening is his condemnation is powerful. Why? Because his charge is valid. He condemns you at a spot you are weakest at. He had a handle of the sins you've committed. He knows you've not been a good son. 
He knows you have not been a responsible parent. He knows you have not been a hardworking worker. He knows you have not been a faithful minister. And as he condemns you, he magnifies your faults and wrong. And the strongest way of condemnation he reserves for us is that he condemned us before the righteous God, the fully righteous God. Now, if someone condemned you before, pastor is bad enough, it does carry some weight, but maybe not as much weight, because in a sense, we are all sinners. Okay? Hmm. But if someone condemned you before the absolutely righteous God, that's really frightening, because it calls for eternal consequences. So when Satan condemns you, he is bringing your crimes, your faults, your wrongdoing, your mistake to the absolutely righteous judge. And I can tell you, people don't see the severity of that condemnation. And here I would say there is another trouble for Christians, especially especially after one become a Christian, after you know the truth, now the truth shines brighter. And your sins are revealed clearer to you now. Then all of a sudden, you realize that you are being condemned for almost everything. And you realize you're being condemned for the things you weren't condemned before. And in the past, before you become a Christian, you're only condemned when you hurt others. And nowadays, as a Christian, you're condemned for not being loving enough to your brethren. You're condemned for not showing enough concern to other brethren. You're condemned for not being faithful in meetings and servings. And sometimes those condemnations are not even external. It's internal. Because even when no one says anything, you feel it yourself. You condemn yourself. Why? Because the truth shines brighter now. You saw the instruction in the Bible and you fall short of it and your hearts get troubled with those condemnations. Now that is when you have to learn to apply the robust and powerful logic of Romans 8.34. Who is he that condemns? And Jesus Christ has died for all your sins. He has resurrected. And in human form, representing us, he is there. At the right hand of God, do what? Interceding for you. Interceding for you. And what is he interceding for us about? You may ask. Now, if you go to Romans 26, you will see that he is interceding for our weakness through the Holy Spirit. Right? Through the Holy Spirit. He's interceding for our weakness through the Holy Spirit with moans and groans. So the robust logic goes like this. If you do not believe that the death and resurrection and the continual intercession by our Lord Jesus is enough to cover your sins, then there is no deliverance for your condemnation. You have to live with those accusations and condemnation all your life. And all your life, you try to defend yourself, try to hide yourself, hide your wrong and shame all the time. You will live with troubled hearts because of the condemnation, whether it is by Satan or by people around you or by your own conscience. But if you do believe and is certain about the Lord Jesus' finished work for you on the cross, and if you believe that his intercession is effective, then you can live condemned free. So this is what Christ meant. Trust in God. Trust in me. My peace I give you, not as the world gives, so do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be troubled by the things that you have not gotten in this life yet. And do not be troubled by your weakness and shortfall. There is no condemnation in Christ. So with that, I've said it most of your internal spiritual issue that you will face in this life. All right, but let's come to the external issue now because we are coming, we need to address the trouble that we will face externally every day. Right? Jesus said, In this world, you will have trouble. Now, don't you think this is like a prophecy that comes true every day? Every day on the news, we see something bad happen, we saw wars happening, 
We saw economy being hit. We saw the earthquake in Japan. We saw the plane on fire. I'm sure you see all that on the news. Now, how do we get around this? Because the trouble of this life is real. And what is troubling is that these troubles makes life really, really uncertain. And we all know life is full of uncertainties. And uncertainties makes us fear. It's a vicious cycle. Now, I hear people say this all the time. We don't know what is going to happen to us next. Whether it's disaster, calamities, retrenchment, sickness, whichever, you name it. And I always hear parents say, oh, I don't know how my child is going to be when he grows up. You know, can he survive in this world? Some old people, you know, start thinking, you know, they will fall sick. I don't know whether I could handle the medical bills when I, I'm really sick and old. Oh. And, and when people start to put their hope on government, on government policies, in the West, you know, people put their hopes on social securities. Now, I'm not saying good governance is not helpful, but I will say... This mentality of trusting in the present world gets us nowhere in facing a troubled life. Why? For the fact that, first, trouble never ends. And second, trouble is uncertain. And what is so troubling is usually when we get hit by something we don't expect. And usually it is the trouble that we don't expect hit us the hardest. Oh, I didn't expect that I will fail the exams. I didn't expect my friends will betray me. I didn't expect the person I love most would cheat on me. I didn't expect my health will fail. I didn't expect, you know what I mean? Now, what is most frightening is when something is out of your expectation and, and that is uncertainty. And even as you try your best to deal with the problem now, you still don't know what it will happen next. So it's always uncertain. And this brings a great amount of stress in our lives. Now, let me offer you the Christian approach to such trouble, okay? Now, let me offer you the Christian. Now, over here, I want to just draw from an analogy, which I think is very apt. An analogy from Martin Lane jones what he suggested in approaching the problem of this life, especially the uncertain problem. Now, some of you don't know Martin Lane Jones. I read him. You know, uh, he he was a doctor turned pastor. He was reformed at doctrine, and he has helped many people who went through depression. He wrote a book on spiritual depression. And when I read him, I thought he was so scientific and spiritual in his approach. Now I will paraphrase him. Now this is what he said. Now. Now, he said the very way to tackle the problem of life, especially when it hits you unexpectedly, is not to rush at the problem. And most people's reaction is to rush at the problem, and that's foolishness. In fact, the logical way to deal with the problem is to step back. Now, picture yourself confronted by a great herd. How do you go over it? How do you go? It's not jumping over it now. Rather, the logical way is to step back. Am I right? You step back from the herder until you have a clear view of that herder. Then you picture that you are going to reach for something else that is beyond it, right? And then you gain momentum and clear that herder. You get what I mean? That's what he said. It's a very simple and logical analogy. And he injected this analogy with something spiritual. Now he said, the biblical approach to unknown problem is this. That is, when you are faced with a problem of unknown, you always start from the known. Okay? I say this again. When you are faced with the problem of unknown, you always start with the known. Then you go from the known to the unknown. Do not start with the unknown immediately. You go further back where you are sure of the certain postulates or the presupposition. And then you lay them down, then approach the problem from what is known to the unknown. Now, you get the philosophy behind. 
It's pretty simple. But it seems to me now that what our Lord Jesus is employing with his disciples here in the Last Supper is the same thing. As I said, the disciples are going to face the darkest moment of their lives and they are going to be plunged into great unknowns very soon. The Lord will be crucified and they are going to be like fugitives in the Jewish nation. Their hopes will be gone. Their future will be unknown, uncertain. But right now, Jesus is speaking to them about the known. Right? About the known. What is the known? Three knowns. Number one, God is known. Trust in God, trust in me. God is known. Christ is known. You know God, you know me. So trust God, trust me. Okay, that's number one. And second, what else can be known? Your eternity is known. Your next life is known. And Jesus went on to say, My Father's house has many rooms. If there were not so, I would, not have, I would have told you. But if there are many rooms, I will go and prepare a place for you. So what Jesus was essentially saying is that your next life is known. It is sealed. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And here Jesus offers a robust reason for his going away. He is effectively telling them, when you don't see me anymore, don't think I've abandoned you. No, no, oh, no, I have not. Don't trust what you see. And don't trust what you don't see. Don't trust your feelings. When you don't see me anymore, understand that I am going away to prepare a place for you, a place of eternity, a place of everlasting joy and glory. So this is the known. You saw that Jesus is providing the known to his disciples. And what is the third known? The third known simply is, Jesus said, I'm coming back for you. I'm going to come back for you. Now there is an end to that uncertainty you are feeling. So by knowing that there is an end to that uncertainty, you could be certain now. Now, it's like a mother telling a young child, and I'm going to leave you in this play at this playground for a while. I'm going to buy some chocolates for you, and then I'm coming back for you. Now that itself is enough to settle the child emotionally, isn't it? Now you contrast it with the mother didn't tell the child. The mother just left, get on with her business, and then, well, she will come back. Yes, she will come back, but in the midst of it, she's going to plunge the child into great anxiety, isn't it? So, by that we know the Lord right now is concerned of the disciples' state of mind when they are going to face great uncertainty. Yes, when the Lord was betrayed, the disciples were all scattered. They were still feeling uncertain and anxious to a certain extent. But the Lord's word goes a long way in settling their hearts. They were kept by grace. Their faith were kept by the Lord's word said during the Last Supper, isn't it? Now, you take a moment to consider what our Lord Jesus has done. Knowing that the disciples will be plunged into great unknowns, our Lord spoke to them about the known. God is known, Christ is known, your eternity is known, and my coming again to end all uncertainty and suffering is known. And you see, our, our Lord really know how to bring comfort to our troubled hearts. So in Christian living, we are not proclaiming a trouble-free life. We are learning how to face the unknowns starting with the known first. You get that? And that brings me back to this theme today again. Live this life in light of your next life. All right? Now, there are no avenues by which you can live peacefully. There are no bases by which the Holy Spirit could work. Okay? Because you know, before or after our Lord talks about this, he promised the Holy Spirit. He promised, and the basis by which the Holy Spirit works is when you appreciate and value the knowns spoken by our Lord Jesus. The Lord promised the Holy Spirit after he spoke this. And you see, we all know the Holy Spirit is all-powerful. 
He, he could regenerate the hearts. He could calm the hearts. He gives peace. He leads us. He strengthens us. He does all things. All these powerful works of the Holy Spirit will not come upon us if we do not appreciate or value what Jesus has spoken about the known. And I want to say that so many believers in church these days are only thought how to handle life, handle stress, handle problems in a temporal, superficial, and circular way. They are only taught temporal methodologies. They are even taught self-help in the church. The intervention they adopt was short-term, temporal, but they are not given the knowns of Christianity. And that's why they are constantly lost in the troubled life of theirs. Now, let me say this to you. You don't need fanciful ideas to minister to your non-Christian friends. When they have seen enough suffering in this world, when they have missed their goals in life, when they are plunged into the emptiness of this life, all they need to know is Christ and His salvation. All they need to know is His eternal promise and His coming again. As simple as that. And my brethren, and if you are asking, Pastor, how do I get through this difficult and troubled life of mine? And the plain answer will be the team. Live this life in view of our next life. Step back. You understand what this life is all about. Understand the trials and sufferings in view of your next life. Our next glorious life, I would say. Because 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17 promises us. Now let's read this together. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Now, my brethren, if you learn to live this life in light of your next life, you will come to realize that the troubles that we are facing in this life is what? It's light and momentary. And as you go along in life, you are going to see all these troubles actually piecing up together one by one, for your glorious making. You know what I mean? Now, I understand what I'm saying here. It could probably sound distasteful to the modern people. Now, I can almost hear them saying, Oh, you Christians, again, you are telling the old story of the pie in the sky. You know? Now, you Christians are not realistic. <laughs> in fact, this has been said since the last couple of hundred years ago, when liberalism has hit the church, we always from then on hear the modern men say, we don't want pie in the sky. We don't want you to tell us what lies ahead after this life. We are practical people. We want practical solutions in this life. We want to hear interesting stories and testimonies. We want concrete strategies, step-by-step -step methods to deal with this life of ours. We want interesting programs in relation to the gospel. And the tragedy is that the church these days buys into this. And the church brings in psychology, brings in self-help, brings in various programs and activities that could trail people and captivate their attention. And the church even became proud of her own achievements that she could garner so many people into the church to only realize she is totally incapable of converting unregenerated people. And don't you know in Singapore, and statistics has done in the church shown that the percentage of Christianity in the past decade has remained stagnant. Though there are so many programs being run in the church, week after week, month after month, but it's futile because the church are not taught how to face the reality of suffering in view of their next life. In fact, Yesterday, when we were on the subject of secularism, I touched at length about how the Christian worldview is at odds with secularism. The true Christian worldview plays great importance and value on the eternal. And surprisingly, I realized this is the least often taught subject in a church. 
Now you speak to Christians nowadays, they will tell you, yeah, pastor, we know there's eternal life, but it's abstract. And they don't talk about it. And some people tell me, my church don't talk about it. We only talk about this life, how to live morally right, how to be a good testimony, good example, you know. All these things, now you think about it. If you take eternity away from the Christian life equation, what does that mean? It means being a Christian is all about just living a good life here on this earth. It will just be about being relevant, being well-liked in this circular world. That is all. There is no battles to fight. There will be no race to run. There will be no truths to contend for. Christianity will just coexist with every other worldviews. Now, in circular environment, we've been pretty much deceived to think that Christianity is all about that, but that's far from the truth. But then suddenly, the world faced wars, strife, COVID, inflation, the threat of AIs, scam, increasing mental illness, rising suicidal rates, even among young people, the sufferings, one after another. Trials, tribulations that people are unable to grapple with. So what does that tell us? It tells us, once again, that the ultimate solution is to look beyond this life. It tells the church, to preach the old gospel, to teach Christians to live this life in view of the next life. It tells the church to go back to the old saying of Hebrews 11.13, where it tells us that the men of faith, they all live as aliens, strangers, foreigners on this earth. They live this life in view of the next life. They work hard for this life only because their hope and joy and crown is in the next life. And now this is the message of the Bible from the beginning till the end. Now don't turn your back on biblical truths. Read the book of life. Savor it. Confirm it. So that your hearts will not be troubled in this life. Right, let's go to Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for the word spoken. It's a wonderful team that you have given the church and especially the English service, and we have received it, we have understood it in our mind. Lord, I pray that it could be internalized into our hearts so that every one of us in this service, we know what we are in for. We know what our spiritual journey should be like, not only for this year, but for the rest of our life. I pray the Holy Spirit minister to every one of us personally, especially if this message ring in our ears, you know, let us be obedient to its message. Thank you. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.